Okay. I would like to start with a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, we are coming together to celebrate the 70 years of the Hamburger and Hamilton paper. And um, I'm very pleased to say that we have over 200 participants from all around the world. So it is um, a good day to everybody in Europe. It is um, a good morning to everybody in the Americas. Um, and of course, a very late afternoon to people in Japan. And I'm really so honored that people took up this opportunity and decided to, to come. So we are, of course, celebrating the chicken. And so let's start with Gallus Gallus and uh, the origin of our humble chicken from the red um, jungle fowl, as shown here. Um, of course, it is a history of 8,000 years or so of domestication of this animal with a huge industry um, and development of specialized breeds. So, so you see here broilers that mature in five to six weeks or we also have layers that lay eggs in some 12 weeks. And you can see that the success of this industry with all the problems that there are, of course, is being celebrated. Um, we should not forget that the chicken always was a model for cancer biology, including um, essays for um, um, cancer angiogenesis and biomaterials um, to combat that. Um, there's also a review article here to uh, remind me, to remind everybody that um, the chicken is of increasing use for the pharmaceutical industry, in particular for the development of drugs and uh, vaccines. Of course, we all love the fancier breeds such as the five-toed chicken and this amazing and very rare Japanese chicken breed that I understand is a natural national natural treasure in Japan. So this all shows us that against what the mouse and the xenopus and the frog um, community tells us, the chicken actually is a genetic model. Now, in order to um, think about why we're using this model, I put a few things together that of course are used for teaching. We are using the chicken because it develops outside the uterus and is easily accessible in an egg. We use the chicken because just looking at the size, it outcompetes the mouse, the xenopus, and the zebrafish. The chicken, to my mind, has an amazingly clear and beautiful de um, developmental anatomy. And of course, the chicken, owing to its extra uterine development, will also help us to comply with the requirements to um, replace refine or reduce animal experimentation. Now, in order to do experiments, we of course have to compare any intervention with how an organism would look like normally at a given stage. And this really is where this study from um, 1951, the normal stages of chicken development comes in, that was put together by um, Howard Hamilton and Victor Hamburger. And here I found an amazing quote from Victor Hamburger saying that the ember is always right. And I think this is still true. Actually, they already realized that the chicken has uses beyond developmental biology. And I think that's my personal opinion. We sometimes need to remind other um, communities and also our funders of that circumstance. So here we are looking at um, Victor Hamburger, and I should say he was a PhD student of Hans Spemann, who of course won the 1936 Nobel Prize um, for the work of another PhD student, Hilde Mangold. And this brings me to introduce our first speaker properly. And here I believe he is, yeah? Uh, and that is Drew Noden, how he looks like uh, today. Let's drink us. Yes, <laughs> it is drink us. Let's drink us. But thank you for the confusion. <laughs> Right, okay, so who are you then, Drew? That's a field promotion for me. <laughs> Unfortunately, because my PowerPoint now doesn't allow me to see my notes, I'm a little bit stuck. Um, and this means that I now will struggle to read out your awards of which you have quite a few, a few including awards for your contribution to teaching. And I believe your textbook from 1982, yeah, is a kind of staple for all veterinary sciences students in the US. 
Um, and obviously you developed your career in your own right. And I believe whatever we know about how the skull, the face develops is largely influenced by your work. And so I look forward to you sharing with us today how you got into science, how you chose the chicken model um, and how that shaped your career and allowed you to make the contribution that you made. And now I would like to move on to the next speaker, who, of course, is Cheryl. I found a lovely picture of you, Cheryl, yeah? yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Cheryl got her PhD from the University in Glasgow, I remember correctly, in 1970, yeah? Um, but then I think you really had your career take off when starting to work on limb development, of course, together with Louis Wolpert, who sadly passed away this January. Um, and if you worldwide think of any study on limb development, if you look into your textbooks, you open any, um, this is Cheryl's work. Um, and I believe you have so many prizes that I can't certainly remember them all. And it's a long list, but I do remember when I was briefly in your lab um, in 1998, that you were the first one to were awarded the Waddington Medal for your contribution to development biology. And since then you became a fellow of the Royal Society and so on and so on, it's endless. I should also say, Cheryl, um, you were one of the first women in science at a time when I believe um, there were few women rising to the top in science at the time. You did it. And so for me, you are a trailblazer. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from you, how you um, developed your career. And again, this was based on the chicken model. And with this, I shall hand over to Drew, please. Let me just open this. Yes, fantastic. And I have to get it up here. Okay, can you all see that? Okay. Um, when uh, Suzanne first contacted me about this and said, would you like to talk about the stage series? I, I was rather hesitant. In my four years working with Victor Homburger, I think we spent maybe 90 seconds talking about the stage series. Uh, and I, I remember one of them, because um, I was working on chickens uh, stage eight, nine, 10. And, and I asked him, how do you identify the true first somite? Because there's stuff in front of it that eh, it's ambiguous. And he walked over to his enormous reprint collection and pulled out a paper uh, on uh, the first somite of the avian embryo by Howard Hamilton. Uh, and uh, there's still controversy about what it constitutes it, but uh, that was our conversation. But what uh, I suggested that I would do is tell some stories and tell, really try to, for those of people, especially the younger people who don't know much of the history of embryology or experimental embryology, how did Homburger come to be such a, a, a prominent figure uh, in the middle part of the 20th century? And how does that relate to his mentor, Hans Spayman, for the first uh, three decades of the century? So, okay, so why is this not advancing? All right, there's something I will try it a different way. Here are our three protagonists, um, Victor and, and Howard. Um, and, uh, Hamilton, I, I, I don't know much about him. Uh, there's not much online about Howard Hamilton. Uh, he trained with Benjamin Willier. He was interested, as was Willier, in pigment uh, development uh, and in, in birds. He was, I believe, the first one, and he did a lot of histology. I believe he was the first person to show that uh, when you had a bird with areas of white, it often had melanocytes that just were not expressing melanin. Um, there are others that in which the melanocyte, other regions where the melanocytes were missing. In the late, uh, Hamilton uh, went to Marine Biology Lab, Woods Hole, in the late 30s and took the embryology course. At that time, Victor was one of the teachers. Later, Victor became the course leader. 
uh, uh, for it. And that's where they met sometime in the late 40s. Uh, uh, Frank Lilly of the development of the Chick asked Hamilton to revise the textbook. Uh, uh, and uh, that had not been done since sometime in the uh, 30s. It was a lot of work. So that's how they, the two of them met and got together. Uh, and they agreed that uh, uh, Hamburger would focus on days two through nine or 10. Uh, those are the stages he worked on either surgically or, or part of the assays. Hamilton would do the later stages and they would do the best they could with the younger stages. And in fact, uh, they did not generate themselves many specimens. Uh, they used a whole set of photographs from Nelson Spratt. Uh, I have a vicarious relation with Nelson Spratt because a student of Spratt's, and Spratt was a tissue culture person. He put lots of people, lots of pieces of avian embryos into auger plates with some other stuff and grew them, put chemicals and uh, whatnot. Um, one of his students, a fellow named J. Robert Harrison, was hired by the tiny little school that I went, where I went to college. He was hired when I was a junior. And up until then, um, I had taken an embryology course, I had taken a comparative course and they were boring as hell. Um, the instructors were big on facts and very short on verbs and no concepts. And uh, uh, Harris, J. Robert Harrison uh, offered a seminar course and he gave us this crazy book by a guy named Waddington. And, and, and that was the first time I actually realized that there were mechanisms. Uh, uh, there was also a lot of verbiage that I had no concept where these words came from, but uh, it was a great time. And then I ended up working in his lab doing Spratt cultures. So um, for the stage series, there were, of course, historically, a lot of people had drawn pictures of avian embryos, other species uh, through the years. Uh, these are two sets of pictures uh, from uh, Ernst Haeckel. The bottom one, of course, is the one that's most famous. These are excerpted, but these were the pictures that he drew as part of his, oh, phylogeny, ontogeny, the biogenetic law. Uh, uh, Ernst Haeckel was an amazing artist. He could draw the most beautiful invertebrates and, and he, he published hundreds of, of papers and books and whatnot. And in some of the uh, earlier ones, here, here's an avian embryo, and it doesn't look at all like that one. <laughs> and there's a lot of controversy. Why did he draw these? So this is this one, I'm pointing to my screen, that the, this is not a chicken embryo. <laughs> I don't know what the species is, but maybe Rich Schneider knows what that species is, but I don't. Um, a lot of controversy. And then uh, at the turn of the century, um, uh, Kaibel and Abraham uh, published this series. Uh, it was several, it, there were several iterations of it published. Um, briefly, uh, Abraham had been an MD student, uh, took Kaibel's embryology course, thought it was fun and wanted to get a PhD. And, and he didn't enroll as a regular full-time student. He would come mainly during the summers and work in Kaibel's lab. Uh, uh, and he, were, he did his PhD on uh, embryonic development of the budger agar. Uh, he was much more interested in psychology and uh, he went and trained with a guy named Sigmund Freud and also took courses with Jung and became a premier psychoanalyst in Germany uh, subsequently. That's my only connection with Freud uh, that I know of. Um, Kaibel was a consummate illustrator, a medical illustrator, and he became quite uh, famous, not because of an academic uh, career, but because of the illustrations. And people around the world would collect embryos and send them to him and he would draw them. Uh, he published 18 volumes of avian or of mammalian embryo development uh, drawings, uh, including the bird. One of the things that people have been most fascinated uh, about these, if you look at the numbers that Kaibel put on them, they are very similar to the ones that Hamburger and Hamilton used. 
Uh, neither of them are available to ask the question, was this purely coincident? Uh, they certainly had seen the, uh, uh, the Kaibal Abraham uh, drawings. Uh, then, of course, there was uh, Lily. And his book, going back to 1908, had lots and lots of sketches. Uh, these are two of them from there. Um, but uh, photography was not uh, widely accessible and you could do it in your lab, but it was very difficult to get it published uh, with any resolution at that time. Uh, and so Hamburger and Hamilton made a number of decisions. And one of them is they would only use photographs, not uh, drawings as uh, key points. They wanted to have anatomical features that were readily apparent um, and whenever possible, they wanted to be quantitative. Number of somites, length of the, the uh, appendages, things like that. Uh, um, in one of his later writings, Victor uh, pointed out that um, uh, drawings are great to emphasize certain features, but they always introduce a bias uh, of whatever the person drawing them wants to highlight. Everything else... Uh, not so much. Photographs, if done well, uh, uh, are, uh, show the details and are much more factual. So um, in the archives, and I, had just, I didn't know about these until I was doing the research for this talk, uh, are three of Homburger's original sketches that he used uh, in preparing the stage series. Uh, for him, the limb series were easy. He, uh, he has a whole set of pictures he drew. Uh, the pharyngeal arches, yeah, this, this, this was at that cranial end of the embryo, which was not particularly uh, uh, his uh, interest. And it's fascinating when you look at these, uh, for example, here, he labeled them A, B, C, D, E, F, but in the publication, the first arch ones are A, B, C, second arch. The other thing that uh, caught my attention, and I, I, he called these, the clefts, the visceral clefts, he called them gill slits. And that term hadn't been used since he was a student in the 20s, uh, the, the last century uh, uh, 20s. Why he did that, I don't know. It certainly was not in the publication. Um, Hamburger was not an artist. He did not draw pictures for enjoyment. He did not draw pictures as evidence, as documentation, uh, uh, whatnot. He drew them on those issues, on those situations where he thought a drawing would be necessary and these were to be given to an artist and they would give focus, uh, but he didn't really enjoy it. When I was uh, the same fellow who came to my small college, um, uh, I worked in his lab and one day he said, uh, uh, Drew, what are you gonna do when you graduate from college? And, well, nobody ever asked me that question before. And I thought I had eight more months to figure this out. It was a different time. People didn't worry about that as much. And he said, well, you seem to like playing with embryos. Why don't you go to a graduate school and do it? And of course this was, the 60s, you had to go to a big book that was published every two years about graduate pro. Anyway, and he said, well, uh, you apply to these three programs, you have good grades, see what happens. And I got into the three of them. One of them, I got a page handwritten letter and it said, oh, I, I heard about your work through your advisor and it sounds very interesting and we have a good program. And, and because I was deeply concerned about the quality of the education, I said, well, any school where somebody writes me a personal letter, that's the place I want to go. That's like a family. And that letter was written by Florence Moe. She was trained as what they then called a physiological developmentalist. Uh, the term biochemistry, I don't think was chic yet. It was not in vogue. Physiology still was. And, uh, and so I went to Wash U, uh, had a desk in her lab. And she was hired by Victor and they developed an eight credit, two semester course in integrating embryo, comparative em anatomy and embryology. And I was the TA uh, for four of my 
uh, six years in graduate school in that course. Victor was in his next to the last year. He was already in his late 60s, last year uh, on the faculty. He gave a few lectures in the course. This was one of them. And you can see the diapsid skull and uh, uh, palata quadrate, all those good reptilian avian structures. Um, their lectures were fascinating. They were scholarly. I doubt if between the two of them, there was one pun uh, offered. Um, they were not conceptual courses, um, but they, they were, I mean, you paid a lot of attention because these were very smart people and they, they clearly really enjoyed what they were doing. Um, in October of the, my second year, and maybe in November, uh, Florence Moog, and if you recognize the name, her nephew was Robert Moog, invented the Moog synthesizer, and he actually built it. He invented it six miles up the road from Ithaca, New York. Um, uh, she uh, uh, asked to see me and she essentially said they had a problem. And what was the problem? Uh, the problem was that Victor was about to retire. He hadn't taught his experimental embryology course in eight years and wanted to do it one more time. They didn't have a TA. Nobody there had taken his course. And they just said, well, you seem to like this stuff. Do you want to do it? Um, that was a transformative experience in a number of ways. Because um, you know, when I asked uh, Professor Mo, well, what do I do? She said, read the book. <laughs> That's what they do. Um, I quickly learned that uh, it involved field work. Uh, uh, they told me to go up to the ecology uh, 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 suite and get a pair of waders. I never wore. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You don't wear waders in Pittsburgh. Um, and um, uh, Victor gave me a map. Uh, 25 miles west of St. Louis, there was a set of ponds and, and, and Bistema laid their eggs there. And they laid their eggs on the first rainy day after the ground had thawed. And out I went, waited, and, and got them. And, and I remember the ponds, and I remember that uh, 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 the same exit off old Route 44, uh, or 40 it may have been, um, there was a diner you walked in, an old diner, and you walked in and had one of those round cases filled with pies. Oh, uh, it was great. Anyway, I'm showing my character flaws. Um, and I was in charge of getting them. We had a Refrigerators at three different temperatures. I knew what the lab was two days a week. I knew what stages I was supposed to have on those days. I had to clean them and whatnot. And they also said, by the way, uh, uh, you need to make a, a tool set for the class of 15. I, a tool set, what, what is it? What exactly is a tool set? Glass balls, glass needles. Uh, hair loops and a Spayman pipette. And the reason that I was asked to make them is that it was really, we didn't have the facilities and it was kind of dangerous. Making Spayman pipettes, you have a lot of glass pieces flowing around. The other thing I discovered is that you have to be very careful if you ask a woman who just gave birth to a blonde baby, if you could have a lock of that baby's hair. They do not take kindly to that uh, without a lot of introduction. So the course went on. And I end up put up here Tarika Tarosa twice, uh, Victor, because he knew Victor Twitty's assistant, who was knew where the Tarika ponds were, got two shipments of Tarika Tarosa. Well, what's the who cares about that? Um, I, I will explain that. Tarika Tarosa. Uh, is filled with pufferfish tetrodotoxin, mm. what's Tarika tetrodotoxin, and it's in all the cells. And um, Victor, by the time I was working with him, was no longer doing experimental embryology, he was interested in development of behavior and how did the sensory and motor components come together. And in amphibians and salamanders, Behavior develops in a very stereotyped way. And Coghill had shown this many, many decades before that, where there's no reflex. And then if you tickle it, you get a little gentle flexure. I got to do flexure. And then it will coil. And then it doesn't ask. 
then it starts swimming and whatnot. And this just shows that. Well, the question is, if you have tetrodotoxin in your system, uh, unless you're a Tarika, that blocks all your synapses. So there is no functional connection between nerves and their target tissues. So uh, we were supposed to transplant Tarika tissues into a uh, maculatum. And of course that narcotized the poor beast. And the question was, would you get these behaviors if you didn't go through those steps? The answer is yes, um, you would. I, I mean, that had been published years before, but we were repeating the experiment. Um, that was important for me for a, a couple of reasons um, unrelated to the particular subject uh, discipline. One, we were required to keep lab books and two thirds of our grade in the course was the lab book. Well, of course I, I made the mistake of using a spiral bound rather than three rings. So every day I would enter what we were doing in the lab and whatnot. And then, then you had to write a report on it. And so, well, how was I gonna do that when there was a spiral? So my, I still have the book, you open it. And on this one, there are six uh, pages scotch taped to one another and you unfold them like an accordion to read uh, what was there. I drew pictures. I like to draw pictures. If I draw a picture of uh, a human being, it looks like a fourth grader, you know, with big square <laughs> uh, embryos I like to draw. Uh, and I had a long write-up of it. And uh, that was important because I think it made a positive impression on Victor. Uh, and I was a good TA. Um, okay. Why else was it important? There's the transplant. February 1968, my first neural crest transplant. Um, and, and I was not thinking of that in any future way. It just happened to be there. Okay, so you've seen this picture. This is Victor at Woods Hall. Uh, this is the 1943 class. It was very hard to get staff uh, in the, during the Second World War, um, but you've already been introduced as Victor. Uh, there's Trinkus over there looking very buff. Uh, and this is Ray Watterson, uh, who uh, also had taken the course, uh, a, a wonderful experimental embryologist. You, you probably don't know the name. He traded with Benj traded, trained with Benjamin Wilger. Uh, but if you wanna know about Ray Watterson, ask Gary Shunwolf, because Ray was Gary's mentor. Um, these were the lectures and labs that Victor led. That's a very large breadth of, of uh, invertebrates. And you say, well, how do you know that? When you went to Spayman's lab, most of what you did the first year was spent three or four days a week, days a week, taking the course in the natural history of animals. And you looked at and dissected representatives of every phylum that were approachable. Uh, he took it and he taught it later for uh, three years. He knew animals, the breadth of uh, animals amazingly. So second reason that TA ship uh, in that course was important is that uh, uh, working in uh, Florence Moe's lab, she worked on development of the intestine and my project started out uh, doing histochemistry on uh, chick embryo intestines, putting them in culture, blah, 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 blah. And you had gone as far as you could with histochemistry and uh, you had to start isolating enzymes. Well, there's two problems for me with isolating enzymes. First, it's biochemistry. Second, you have to do it in a cold room. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Um, uh, wasn't going to do it. So uh, she and, and, and Victor had a conversation, I guess. And he said, okay, even though I'm about to retire, come on up. This is the project he wanted me to do. He had been interested in uh, sensory ganglion development, especially uh, 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 because there are two types of cells that you see in the embryo. Uh, 
the big ones around the periphery and the small ones uh, uh, near the core. It's true in every sensory ganglia and the spinal ganglia, uh, cranial ganglia. Um, but the problem he had was that in the head, it was already known, shown that the big cells came from placodes and the little cells came from neural crest. Well, there are no placodes in the trunk. So why do you have the same two cell types with dual origin in one place and single origin in uh, another part of the body? Uh, he had seen a paper was published in 1963 by Jim Weston, where you could load up cells with treated thymidine, transplant them to another enabled embryo, do uh, radioautography. And uh, um, he said, well, why don't you use that method and just repeat this work, but follow the lineages, see what they become. It seemed like a really good idea. It worked. Um, uh, I got essentially the similar results to what he did. There was a problem. Uh, you're running a marathon with uh, the dilution of the tritium. And you've got this, the experiments were done at about a 30 hour check embryo. And you had about two days before the tritium level was so low that you really couldn't do it. So you can't follow these. Um, but I had fun. I did the transplants, uh, midbrain and, and whatnot, did 3D reconstructions, drew pictures. And, and there, there was a day when I had uh, some great donor embryos, but the, the host embryos were not stage matched correctly. So what I did was instead of doing transplants, midbrain to midbrain, hindbrain to hindbrain, I just took a bunch of midbrain crest cells, put them back here, and lo and behold, they did the same as the hindbrain crest cells in terms of patterns of migration. Well, suddenly the embryo gave me an answer to a question I was never smart enough to ask. And, um, um, and Victor got much more interested in the project and, and the rest is history. This is a statement that uh, he published uh, 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 many years after I worked with him that uh, uh, make a pact with the embryo, he'd never put it in homogenizers. And I didn't know that was his belief system, but I embraced it wholeheartedly uh, after the fact. So here are his mentors, Spayman and Harrison. Um, Victor, uh, as a mentor uh, and for people he know, he was always calm. He was very curious. He would discuss anything, but he had strong convictions, but he never showed bravado. He, he did not have a, an element of hubris in his body. Um, in the lab, he came in most days. Uh, he was no longer doing lab work. Uh, he had postdocs working on the behavior kinds of things and whatnot. Um, he was always available, knock on his, he never shut his, his office door unless you're having a meeting. Uh, you knock on the door, you walk in, ask him a question. Uh, he would never walk up to you and ask you how you were doing. If you had, you were on your own uh, and, and um, uh, he expected you to do serious work, come to him if you had a problem. Uh, Spayman. Spayman was the right person at the right time. What do I mean by that? He trained with Bovary. Uh, uh, Bovary was the king of chromosomes in the late uh, 19th century. He had all kinds of ideas of what they were, and he studied them in lots of different species. Uh, um, some of his work stimulated Weissman. When he was finishing his PhD, he caught tuberculosis and they said, you got to go to Spain and, and recuperate in the sunshine. And the only thing he took with him was Spayman's book on germplasm. And that was the stimulation uh, for him. And what was in there? Well, uh, you probably all know that. And this is Victor's comment on it, that you know, Weissman's conclusions were entirely incorrect but the theory was the first testable hypothesis ever about development. And I'm not gonna go through the work of Spayman from 1900 until 1925. 
brilliant work, creative, imaginative, inventing terms like induction, actually testing autonomous and dependent um, uh, nuclear equipment. Uh, he showed in 1918 by dorsal lip transplants that mesoderm was necessary for the neural tube, but he couldn't figure, because they were same species, he didn't know what the mesoderm actually contributed to and whatnot. Um, and therein then uh, uh, led to the experiment by Hilda Preschel and Hilda Mangle. She did at least 140 transplants of which six survived and were published. Uh, this is UMB number eight. Victor and Holt Freyder and Hilda and Spayman, not Hans, Spayman, <laughs> were in the lab having a conversation well, they three of them are, and Hilda walked in and said, look what I have here. Imagine being in the room when you saw that embryo. That was the embryo, that her first survival. Uh, uh, amazing. And um, uh, of course, her story uh, is that. Uh, um, That launched, of course, uh, a, a huge uh, uh, following. Spayman is, is one of the most frequently misrepresented characters in the history of, of science, I think. He was a complicated person. He was steeped in Goethe and nature philosophy. Uh, Victor's, when Vic when Victor came back as an instructor to Freiburg, he was then for the first time invited to Spayman's home. You, Spayman did not invite graduate students to the home. That was not what you did. Um, and Victor remembers walking into his home study, one whole wall were the complete works of Goethe. That's a huge amount of work. Um, but, he, you know, he, but he was not a romantic in that traditional sense of the word. He was very mechanistic. And, you know, he's often thought of by the term organizer that he, he was very focused on the stimulus and not on the response. This is what he said in the last paragraph of that paper. Uh, it's interaction between the two that play a large role in development. And that certainly uh, uh, turned out to be the most telling feature of that. Victor's project was unrelated to the organizer and he was uh, testing a, a, a results that had come earlier that if you take a fellow had taken an eye out of a salamander larva, a frog larva, excuse me, uh, the midbrain didn't develop well and some of the limbs had malformations. Well, how can, how can hypoplasia of the midbrain cause a limb malformation? And Victor didn't believe it. Uh, for one, he grew up bringing frog and salamander eggs into his home and growing them up. And he saw lots of them had limb malformations. It happens out there. Um, so he repeated it, got normal legs. It was just a, 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 a bunch of bogus uh, claims. Um, and this is what he had to say of working in, in Spayman's lab. Um, and I'll let you read them, but um, there's a big difference between being holistic in how you think about the embryo and being vitalistic in what you think the processes are. And, and Spayman was not a vitalist at all. He was a mechanist. He just believed that the sum of the parts was greater than uh, uh, or the whole was greater than the sum of the parts. Spayman and Hamburger were very different people in many respects. And, and this is how I want to show that. Spayman loved doing transplants. They thrilled doing them. Uh, I have a dialogue with the embryo. Victor never had a dialogue with the embryo. Um, this quote uh, that uh, Suzanne showed recently. He had respect for the embryo. The embryo offered a means for him to get answers to questions. 
It was not an emotional relationship. And in fact, Victor was very, very clear that limbic driven behaviors had no place in science in the lab. And he was a warm person, he was kind, but he would, did not express any of those emotions in the context of doing science. It was a purely rational. How he put up with me, I have no idea um, because that, that is just not, it's just not my temperament, uh, but uh, uh, enormous. Harrison. Harrison married a, a German woman, and uh, he also had studied in Germany. He spoke fluent German. And after the Second World War, almost every summer, he spent between uh, two weeks and two months in Germany. And after he made his peace with the in-laws, then he went and visited all of his friends. He would spend up to a month in Spayman's lab in those summers, beginning at least in 1919. Victor arrived in 1920. Uh, Harrison was immediately drawn to Victor because Victor was working on the development of the nervous system. Spayman had no real interest in, after the neural plate closed, uh, that was the end of his interest. Harrison, first in vitro culture of nerves. Uh, doesn't seem like much today, but in 1907, 1910, most people believed that the nervous system was a reticulum, not that individual cells gave rise to projections that then had to make nice with the targets. Harrison disproved that monumental work. And then he went did all this work on limb development, studying you know, how does the forelimb and the hind limb know their fore and hind? How does dorsal and ventral, how do the axes get us done? Beautiful work. Um, and very different approaches. Um, uh, Spayman was focused on cause and effect as it related to inductors. Um, and Harrison was interested in fields and how cells communicated, not because he wanted to know what the mechanisms were, but he wanted to know how the populations behaved. Um, different approach, different perspective. Harrison was getting variable results and knew he had to be much more precise about the stages of his embryos because it was a matter of just a few hours between when DV and AP axis were established in those limb fields. And so he made a stage series first with photographs and then several years later, uh, um, Elizabeth Krauss made these drawings. Um, Harrison gave Victor a set of photographs in 1921 of this stage series. Victor was having similar problems of some variable results and Victor made this stage series for himself. These are Victor's drawings of a uh, uh, frog, uh, Rana Fusca development. And they had the little you know, blurbs and whatnot with them that I photoshopped out just to, to make it uh, clearer. There's uh, his homage to uh, the stepping stones to the stage series. We did the same experiments with the rotations in the limb. Uh, and, and these were my attempts and whatnot and wrote it all up and had the accordion folded descriptions and, and whatnot, turned it into Victor. And, and a couple of days later, my notebook was uh, back on the desk because you know I was trying to figure out, well, look at that craziness. You know, you know I, don't even, I didn't reread what I wrote for it, but I'm sure it was just dribble. Uh, and there on my desk was a paper by uh, a student of Harrison who I had never heard of before. And in that paper was this. He didn't talk about it. He didn't yell, oh, you should have read the paper. He said, you know, there is an explanation. And the explanation was I mangled the transplant <laughs> you know, with my hair to I probably cut it three pieces. Um, anyway. I want to finish up uh, with his work uh, uh, in uh, Chicago. He went uh, to, Chicago, to Chicago for a year because Spayman uh, told him, you know, 
Amphibians are not a good system if you want to work on the, a good model, if you want to work on the development of the central nervous system. It's just mushy. Um, and uh, Spayman knew Frank Lilly at Chicago and said, you yeah, know, that's a good school. You ought to go there. He did. He went on a one year Rockefeller. He, in the process, uh, anyone of Jewish heritage was banned from German universities. And so he couldn't go back, got an extension for three years and uh, never went back, didn't go back to Germany for several decades. That's when he brought this. And what he did, uh, first of all, he found uh, life in America was very different. Um, no one in Germany ever called Spayman Hansi, but Willard was Benji, Mary Rawls was Mary. And, and it was true for everybody. It was, it was a much more egalitarian uh, uh, system than he was used to. Um, and so he just all kinds of things with transplanting limbs, turning them around, making two limbs, leg to wing. And these are, I'm waving my hand, these are all shown and did extirpations. Well, in, for these double wing and the extirpations, those embryos were embedded, sectioned, and silver stained. And this is a normal section and spinal ganglia. There's the lateral motor column. On the extirpated side, the neurons are missing. The neurons are, there are too few of them. And Victor's hypothesis was that the first projections that went out found nothing, nothing there, no limb muscle. Uh, no limb periphery. And they sent the message back to the remaining germinative population. Don't bother making neurons. There's no use for you. It's a re recruitment hypothesis. It, he had a list of about 25 people that he would send reprints to. One of them was Giuseppe Levy. And Giuseppe Levy was in Turin. Giuseppe Levy wasn't that interested. He was a neurohistologist. He wasn't that interested in development. So he gave it to a research assistant who had been an MD student with him, a uh, bright young lady working in the lab. And she read it and she said, this is bunk. Uh, I, I don't know the Italian word for bunk, but, uh, and she was much more polite. No, she probably said it that way. Um, and um, uh, the war broke out, things got horrible. Uh, she did some, she did repeated the experiments. And the difference was that Victor did the experiments on a, a three day chick and looked at it seven to 10 days later. She looked at it two days later, three days later, four days later, sectioned them. And what she found was that no, the full complement of neurons die, forms, and then they die off if there's no target for them. Totally different uh, uh, conclusion. That paper came out in 1946 and 1947 at his invitation. Rita Levi came. If you don't read any other book about a heroine in science, she is it. She is a marvelous. She was still there when I came to St. Louis. And, and, and they were, I wouldn't say they were dear friends. They had the highest respect for one another. But I remember walking down the hall and Victor would be on the third floor and they were having some discussion. And when you have a discussion with Rita, Victor is talking like this and Rita is talking like this. She was in the basement still talking to Victor over the balcony of the third floor. Uh, and uh, but she is a remarkable, remarkable person. And a series of pure coincidental events led to the discovery of nerve growth factor uh, and the rest is history. This is the picture that was on my wall for 51 years over my desk. Uh, and I would often look at that and say, sorry, Victor, not today. Uh, but um, uh, I found this quote uh, that he had published uh, much later. Uh, um, and I realized how true that is for so many of us. Um, and I will leave you with this, um, which I take some uh, uh, comfort in. Uh, things change and uh, the experimental design and the data are critical. 
what you have to say about the data comes and goes, it's very ephemeral. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to close. That's, that's my homage. Uh, I realize nobody's gonna write this down, but I felt I should uh, acknowledge that most of what I'm saying is from these. The only one that is not available in 1971, we persuaded Victor to give a graduate seminar in the history of ex experimental embryology. Uh, and I recorded them. I recorded Victor talking about taking a philosophy course from Hans Driesch. Uh, 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 and, and of course, he never met Rue. He, his opinion of Rue was, Rue was extraordinarily dogmatic. He was narrow-minded. He published uh, three uh, monographs, large monographs of 800 pages with three pictures of embryos. And to Victor, that's not reality. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, those are my very personal reflections on uh, Victor. And, and I thank you for your attention. And now I straighten the time. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Drew. That was terrific. Thank you very, very much. I suppose we hand over to Sharon because many questions I guess people will have probably will be similar for the two of you. So Sharon, if you would be so kind and connect and, and it is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Well, it was really fascinating to hear your experiences with Victor Hamburger and also to hear how he came to work on the chick and all the influences um, on him. I'm going to take rather a different tra track because I don't, I don't, and I never met Hamburger or Hamilton, but I was able to find a link, a tenuous link to Hamilton, and that was through John Trinkers, who in fact you showed a picture of um, at the Woods Hole. Because Howard Hamilton, as you said, revised a copy of the development of the chick, and the advisory editor was Benjamin Williers, and John Trinkers was a student of Williers. And I actually did a postdoc with John Trinkus. So I do have some very indirect connection uh, with Hamilton. I want to take a rather different track and tell you about some of my own research on uh, chick embryos and the way in which I think they influenced um, understanding of the development of the limb in particular. And so the first um, thing I'd like to say, first of all, is that my favorite Hamilton hamburger stages are stages around stage 20. And this is because at this, at this stage, uh, there are well-developed limb buds in the embryo, which will give rise to the limbs. Quite a lot happens um, at three days of incubation, um, but one of the things that I was interested in or became interested in was limb development. So we can see here 19, 20, 21 um, stages, and we can see the bulges that give rise to the limb buds. And then what happens is that these buds grow out, elongate from the body wall, and as they do so, cells begin to differentiate within them to lay down the skeleton of the wing. And what we can see here in black are cells differentiating to form cartilage, which lays down the skeleton. And this occurs in a progressive direction with structures like the humerus uh, being laid down first and structures such as the digits being formed last. So over a period of about seven days then, uh, the chick wing bud develops. And you can see that the end result is a uh, skeleton of the chick wing, which is rather typical of a vertebrate skeleton, except that it only has three digits, and these are actually morphologically distinct. So most of my career then has been spent on uh, working on chick wing development. Uh, 
So how did this happen? How did I come to work on chick limb development? So as Susanna said, in fact, I did my PhD uh, with Adam Curtis in Glasgow. And this came about because I wanted uh, to study cell behavior uh, in embryos. And I was actually inspired by my final undergraduate lectures um, and decided that cells were where things were at. And at that time in the 60s, one of the most exciting areas in terms of cell behavior was experiments uh, by Steinberg in particular on sorting out. And this is a phenomenon where cells were disaggregated, then re-aggregated again. And uh, the spatial organization um, of structures was, was re-established. And I was in Glasgow because Adam moved to Glasgow to become head of, depart head of the Department of Cell Biology uh, in Glasgow, which was the first cell biology department in the UK. So sorting out had a long history at the beginning of the last century. Some of the experiments were on sponges where people took a sponge and squeezed it through a, a mesh, a sieve, disaggregated the sponge into single cells, which then came together and reconstituted reconstitute as a sponge. But in the 1950s, experiments by Towns and Holtfreiter on dis disaggregated um, cells uh, from amphibian embryos were quite exciting because it turned out that if you took the cells from all three layers, disaggregated them, re-aggregated them again, in the aggregates, you could reconstitute the same arrangement of the three layers that occurred in the embryo. And so people found this quite exciting and wanted to know uh, the mechanisms involved. And experiments by Steinberg um, used a model system where he used disaggregated cells from developing chick tissues. And so in my PhD, I worked on sorting out and used tissues from developing chick embryos. And this was my first introduction uh, to chick embryos. After my PhD, I then went to um, America, to Yale, to work with John Trinkus, who we've already seen. And John Trinkus um, was interested in cell behavior. He was interested in sorting out in cell, how cells moved and particularly um, studied fish embryos. And while I was there, I didn't work on chick embryos at all. I worked on cell lines. Uh, his lab was next to the lab of Frank Ruddle and I learned how to culture cell lines and tried to develop a system where I could use different cell lines to look at sorting out. And I also started to analyze cell movements and re-aggregation in the early development of annual fish. But my most fruitful work there was studying the movement of deep cells of killifish at Woods Hole with Trinkus. And Trinkus would sit there and he would decorionate um, uh, eggs of the killifish. Um, it was very delicate work. He used to sit there doing this and then he would pass the embryos to me and I would then culture the cells and we did various experiments looking at the way in which uh, the cells behaved. And it wasn't then till I returned to the UK to work with Lewis Wolpert that I reacquainted myself as it were uh, with the chick embryo. So actually Lewis had been uh, my PhD examiner, and he'd recently uh, published his paper on positional information. And in this paper, he talked about applying his concepts uh, to various models, and one of the models uh, was limb development. My original plan was to look at sorting out in limb development, but of course, given uh, what was happening in the lab, I soon changed and started working on Lewis's ideas. So what was important there was that uh, basically um, he was working on uh, pattern formation. Um, sorting out is shown in the bottom uh, series of panels. What I was working on for my PhD, the idea that maybe to make a pattern, cells could be assigned distinct characters in a random arrangement and then sort out to generate a pattern. What Lewis had suggested is that pattern formation um, uh, he, he suggested that positional information could be a way of making a pattern. 
And in this concept, he suggested that pattern formation was a two-step process. First of all, um, cells are assigned characters according to their position. And in a second step, they then interpret uh, the positional information uh, to behave appropriately. So he'd also, as I said, one of these systems in his 1969 paper um, that he talked about where he thought perhaps he could apply his ideas about positional information was development of the chick wing. And by this time, um, the chick wing had become a very a well-researched um, system, uh, particularly in terms of the way in which it developed by John Saunders. John Saunders actually was also a student of Willier. And during his PhD, apparently, Willier said to him, um, say, John, uh, can you find out what that transparent rim does on the outside of the limb bud, which, which we now call the apical ectodermal ridge. And in his PhD, um, John Saunders then uh, established that the apical ectodermal ridge, this transparent rim to the limb bud, had an important role in um, mediating outgrowth of the limb. And what he showed was, this is from his uh, 1948 paper, that apical ectodermal ridge removal uh, leads to limb truncations. And so he had identified them, one of the important uh, regions in the chick limb, um, which was important for laying down the pattern along the long axis of the limb. So I said that there were two signaling regions. There was the apical ectodermal ridge identified by John Saunders. And John Saunders also with Mary Gaisling identified a second important signaling region in the limb. And this was a region that he called the zone of polarizing activity or polarizing region. And this uh, had an important effect on the pattern of structures that developed across the anteroposterior uh, axis of the limb. Sorry, I'm going to have to go back again. Sorry, here we are, that's it, sorry. So this is another paper from John Saunders, now in 1968, just before Lewis published his paper on positional information in which John Saunders and Mary Gaisling showed that graphs of this small region of mesenchyme cells at the posterior margin of the limb bud had a dramatic effect on the pattern of digits that developed. When you planted this at the opposite side of the limb bud, at the anterior side of the limb bud, you ended up with these pattern duplications. And in this particular example, the pattern of digits is four, three, two, three, four. The normal limb just has uh, three digits, two, three, and four. So by this time then, uh, when Lewis had published his positional information paper, we had this very rich embryology um, of the developing limb. And most of my work has been concentrated, first of all, on looking at the uh, way in which the polarizing region uh, controlled uh, development of the limb. So the limb you can think of as having the three axes, we talked about them before, the uh, uh, antero posterior is a thumb to little finger axis, the proximo distal is the shoulder to digits, and then of course you have the dorsoventral axis. And Lewis's idea was that um, within the developing limb bud, cells integrated information about their position in relation to these three different axes. And the axis that I started to work on was the anteroposterior axis, the axis which was controlled by signaling of the polarizing region. And Lewis's model for how this worked was that he suggested that the polarizing region uh, produced a morphogen which diffused across the limb to set up a concentration gradient. And so the first, um, uh, uh, first line here, and I can't really show you on the screen, um, it shows the normal limb. So cells at different uh, positions across the limb bud would be exposed to different concentrations of morphogen, and this would provide them with information about their position, and then they'd use this information uh, to, uh, to, to develop into the appropriate digits, so that cells near the polarizing region, which is at the posterior, would see high concentrations of morphogen 
and form digit four, which is the most posterior digit in the chick wing, whereas cells much further away would um, experience lower concentrations of morphogen form digit two. And this diagram here just shows uh, predicted what you would predict if you grafted the polarizing region in different positions um, a, a, away from the original polarizing region. So the prediction of his model then was that the type of digit that developed depended on distance uh, from the polarizing region. And with Dennis Summerbell, uh, these were the first experiments that I did on the chick wing when I joined Lewis's lab. Uh, in which Dennis and I sat down and we grafted the polarizing region into different positions across the anteroposterior axis. And we found that indeed uh, the pattern of digits, the type of digit that developed, depended on distance. If the two polarizing regions were very close together, uh, no digit twos developed at all. So this was um, very exciting because it um, uh, suggested that, in fact, uh, this kind of model might be a, a fruitful way of looking at how the polarizing region worked. Uh, we also very soon afterwards did another important experiment, which was also done by other people, but partic was particularly important in terms of Lewis's model. And this was when we found that tissue from the posterior margin of a mouse limb bud, when grafted to a chick wing bud, uh, induced additional chick wing digits. So what this experiment showed then very clearly is that when we place the mouse tissue in the chick wing, um, the, the signal from, from that tissue must be the same um, as that of the chick. But because the responding cells are chick cells, they would form additional chick cells rather than, uh, 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 chick digits rather than mouse digits. So this was actually quite an important experiment in terms of interpreting it, in terms of the um, Lewis's ideas uh, of positional information. Now we carried out many other experiments that were consistent with the idea that the polarizing region uh, produced a morphogen that patterned the digits. But an important um, 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 uh, thing that happened was that in 1976, Bruce Albert came to Lewis's lab on a sabbatical uh, bringing beads. So Bruce Albert then um, is a, a biochemist, um, but had decided he, that he was interested in uh, the chick limb development. And so the idea was that uh, we would extract, um, ex make extracts from the polarizing region and then um, soak uh, beads in these extracts and apply them uh, to the chick limb, to the anterior margin of the chick limb, because this was our assay for polarizing activity. And we'd also uh, take sort of substances off the shelf that we thought might be interesting. I mean, there was some evidence, for instance, that insulin um, could perhaps, in some cases, uh, lead to duplications in ducks. Um, so we tried insulin. This is really the first sort of um, attempt at a chemical screen, but it was much more just taking um, chemicals off the shelf when we felt like it. And um, obviously uh, we carried out a lot of experiments on these beads. It turned out that that was very, um, very sensitive um, to, to electrostatic so that we would spend a whole lot of time ex making the extract of the polarized region on a bead. And then I would go to pick it up with my forceps and it would ping away and we'd lose it completely. So uh, we didn't have anything to graft. Anyway, we spent a long time doing this, um, but with no end result. But some years later, um, uh, it, by, purely by chance, we actually did come across something uh, that did work. Because, of course, the whole uh, hypothesis was wonderful, but without any, any sort of chemical, uh, it was really literally just a hypothesis. But in uh, the early 1980s, at uh, last, we found... Um, a defined chemical that would mimic um, signaling of the polarizing region. And this came about because um, uh, Lewis had, had met someone called John Pitts who worked on cell-cell communication. And John Pitts had told Lewis that uh, retinoic acid um, uh, affected cell-cell uh, communication. And we were actually interested in cell-cell communication as a mechanism for uh, cells um, uh, uh, obtaining positional information. 
And that summer in the 90, early 1980s, Juliet Lee came to work with me. She was, a, she was a student at a different university who'd heard Lewis give a talk, different university in London, and she wanted to come as a volunteer, which she did for the summer. And um, the experiments that she did were extraordinarily exciting because uh, what we found was that if we soaked carriers in retinoic acid, uh, we could actually mimic uh, signaling by the polarizing region. And I remember uh, seeing the first um, example of what had happened, and it was a, really a sort of breathtaking moment uh, to suddenly see uh, these extra digits, because for years we'd applied all sorts of things to the developing limb uh, with no result. So uh, we had then um, a molecule that would mimic um, signaling of the polarizing region, but we had no other knowledge really of any other molecules uh, that were um, important in limb development. Um, and so to sort of fast forward to the 1990s, I found that this I think was the golden age where we went from transplant to transcript, if you like. And using the chick um, embryo was very important here because we were able to carry out experiments very quickly and quite cleanly uh, to give re real clues into what was happening in terms of limb development. By this time, of course, um, what had changed was that um, vertebrate homologues of developmentally important genes that had been identified in Drosophila uh, were now being found in vertebrates. And a number of workers actually then um, cloned chick homologues um, of these um, genes. And so with Eddie de Robertus and then with Denny de Boule, we looked at the uh, expression of Hox genes in the developing limb and related it to chick wing pattern. We showed, for example, that if you duplicated the limb with retinoic acid, you duplicated uh, the pattern of Hox gene expression. Also, uh, we found that um, fibroblast growth factors are the apical ectodermal ridge signal. This was work with Gail Martin and Lee Neiswander. And finally, we also showed that uh, bone morphogenetic proteins were involved in polarizing region signaling. Uh, the FGFs turned out to be very important molecules in limb development, and the chick was actually central uh, to showing this. So a, quite a simple experiment for um, an experimental embryologist is to remove the apical ectodermal ridge. And then we could use the sort of bead technology that had been initiated by Bruce Alberts. By using uh, particular kinds of beads, we could apply various uh, chemicals to the developing limb using sort of experimental techniques. And this is just a picture here showing one of the experiments done by one of my students where uh, we removed the posterior part of the apical ectodermal ridge, and you could see this is on the, uh, the left-hand side, no digits. And then if you added a bead soaked in FGF, you could actually rescue um, limb development. So this was a, a very um, striking result, and I think really gave quite, really quite firm evidence that FGFs uh, were the apical ectodermal ridge signaling. And it's worth sort of contrasting this experiment in the chick with um, Gail's later experiments where she more or less uh, confirmed the same thing in the mouse. But in the mouse, of course, it became much more complicated because it turned out for her to do this experiment, there were at least three different FGFs expressed in the apical ectodermal ridge. Um, so you had to knock them all out. And the further complication was that some of these FGFs like FGF4 is very important in early mouse development. And so you actually had to make a conditional knockout. So you had to make conditional knockouts and multiple knockouts all at the same time. And what she showed was that if she did a triple knockout where she knocked out FGF8, FGF4 and FGF9 together, triple knockout, um, she ended up uh, with a limb truncation. So the chick really showed the way here. Um, and uh, Subsequently, these sorts of experiments in the mouse showed that uh, the sort of conclusions, the general conclusion uh, was correct. And it turned out that actually FGS were very important um, from the beginning of, 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 uh, of development and later on. And um, this goes back actually to one of the experiments um, uh, Drew was talking about, um, amphibians. And in fact, 
um, one of my students um, showed that if you implanted a bead soaked in FDF just for two hours to the region of the flank, which would normally not form a limb at all, which would normally end up in the interlimb region, you could induce a complete extra limb. And people thought that this was a very uh, surprising um, and slightly uncomfortable result, that it was so easy uh, just with this defined chemical for just a couple of hours uh, to uh, elicit uh, this uh, very remarkable effect. And of course, this led to a whole other series um, of experiments. Also, perhaps less well-known, but an experiment I particularly like was that um, using FGF, uh, FGF uh, initiates limb development, it's important for limb outgrowth and patterning along the long axis of the limb, but also you have to shut it off uh, at the end of patterning. And if you don't, uh, you can get abnormalities. And in this particular experiment, uh, FGF expression was prolonged in the apical ectodermal ridge. And in this case, as shown by the arrow, what happens is that you get an additional toe phalanx um, in the chick embryo. So FGFs then, it's important, FGFs at the beginning of limb development, during limb development, but it's important that you actually switch them off um, at the end. Now, I mentioned on the other slide um, that we um, discovered that BMPs or suggested that BMPs could be important in, in patterning of in polarizing region signaling. Now, by this time, it had become clear that retinoic acid itself was unlikely to be the morphogen that patterns the digits. But instead, what retinoic acid does when you implant a bead soaked in retinoic acid to the anterior margin of the limb and get digit duplications is that you're inducing a new polarizing region. And so the question then was, well, what is the polarizing morphogen um, produced as a consequence of retinoic acid signaling? And what we'd found was that uh, BMP2 was expressed in the posterior margin of the wing bud and that when you implanted a bead soaked in retinoic acid to the anterior margin, you could induce a new domain uh, of BMP2 expression. But when we took a bead soaked in, in BMP2 and implanted it to the anterior margin of the limb, we didn't get a, a duplication. And so this was a bit of a puzzle, um, exactly what the BMPs could do. And meanwhile, while we were doing these experiments, uh, Cliff Tabin, um, identified sonic hedgehog um, as the polarizing region morphogen. Um, Cliff had uh, cloned the uh, chicken hedgehog gene sonic hedgehog and showed that sonic hedgehog fitted the bill as being the polarizing region morphogen. It was expressed in the polarizing region. Uh, you, when you added a bead soaked in retinoic acid to the anterior margin of the limb, you could induce a new uh, patch of sonic hedgehog expression. And more importantly, uh, when you took a bead uh, soaked in sonic hedgehog protein and implanted that at the anterior margin of the limb, uh, you got these mirror image duplicated patterns. So um, it looked then as though, um, so then this, these experiments then um, uh, really suggested that uh, sonic hedgehog uh, was the polarizing region morphogen. And a number of uh, many people, including ourselves, uh, turned our attention um, to sonic hedgehog. So one of the most interesting things we found uh, studying the effects of sonic hedgehog on the chick wing was the way in which sonic hedgehog signaling uh, integrates positional information and growth. And these are experiments um, carried out by one of my postdocs, Matt Towers. And what we did here is we, imply, we applied various drug inhibitors um, to the chick wing um, and just found the effect on normal chick development. So if we used a drug that would inhibit sonic hedgehog signaling, as shown in the top here, uh, what happened was that the number of digits that developed was reduced. We only had two digits, but the digit pattern was two, three. However, if on the bottom line here, if we then just inhibited growth downstream of sonic hedgehog, Again, we only got two digits, but now uh, they were digits three and four. And this showed quite nicely um, that Sonic Hedgehog not only uh, uh, specifies 
or appears to specify positional information, it also controls growth. And it also gave information about which the way in which uh, these two processes uh, were integrated. We also did some more work on BMP signaling, and there's evidence that perhaps BMPs may actually work downstream of Sonic Hedgehog um, in patterning the limb. Now, I just want to end by talking a little bit about um, a chicken mutant that we worked on for, for some considerable years. And this again um, highlights um, the importance of chickens um, in, uh, in understanding uh, basic processes. And the chicken mutant that we worked on for a long time has been the Talpid 3 chicken mutant. And as one of my postdocs said, this is a story from barnyard to bedside. So the, chick the chicken mutant was discovered actually in the 1960s, initially because the eggs have reduced hatchability. And the reason for this is that the Talpid 3 mutation causes embryonic lethality and the embryos have many defects, including limb, limb defects. And for many years, the embryologist um, Donald Ede uh, worked on the Talpid uh, 3 uh, mutant. And when he retired, um, the flock went to Dave Burt at the uh, Roslyn Institute. And we started to work with Dave Burt, various PhD students that I had and postdocs, um, particularly um, because of the uh, discoveries, molecular discoveries, gave us new tools to look and understand um, what might be going wrong in Talpid 3. So the next slide just shows you um, some embryos. The uh, Talpid embryo is on the right-hand side, and uh, there's just a picture here of a stained limb. So the limb defects in, in Talpid is that uh, uh, you have no patterning of the digits across the anteroposterior axis. In fact, you have a number of digits develop, increased number of digits, and they all look rather similar. So obviously the first uh, experiment we did, given uh, what we knew about sonic hedgehog, was to look at sonic hedgehog expression in the talpid uh, wing bud, which we did. And what we found, perhaps surprisingly, was that um, in the talpid wing bud, look how huge it is, it's actually huge. Uh, nevertheless, uh, sonic hedgehog expression um, is restricted to the posterior margin, just as it is um, in the normal limb. And so there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with um, sonic hedgehog signaling. It must be the response of the cells to sonic hedgehog signaling that's abnormal. Now, David Burt actually is um, a geneticist and um, what he started to do was to try and map where the uh, Talpid mutation was. And this was greatly aided actually by um, sequencing of the chicken genome. It's very difficult before then, and, but Dave um, Burt persisted and found that the Talpid 3 mutation maps to a region of the chromosome 5 and identified the gene as this Kia 0586. Now this... Um, didn't really help that much because uh, it turned out that this um, uh, gene encoded a protein of unknown function. And so um, we were obviously then turned our attention to trying to find out um, what the protein encoded by the Talpid 3 gene um, did. By this time, it was also clear um, that sonic hedgehog signal transduction takes place on primary cilia. And this was work initially by Catherine Anderson, who showed that um, mut mutants um, in ciliary proteins um, uh, had, had defects. Um, and so um, what, what happens then is that uh, the signal, um, uh, sonic hedgehog signal then is transduced uh, on these primary cilia. And therefore this gave us an idea of perhaps um, looking at uh, where the uh, talpid protein um, localizes in the cell and its effect on cilia. And we were able to show, this was rather difficult to see, we were able to show um, that uh, the talpid 3 gene encodes a centrosomal protein. These are experiments in the talpid and um, talpid 3, um, embryo, uh, talpid 3 antibody along the top here. Uh, gamma tubulin uh, um, 
highlighting the centrosome. And you can see that uh, the tau 3 protein co-localizes um, with, with the centrosome. And furthermore, uh, when we looked at the cells, we could see that the tau 3 limb bud cells see the centrosome, this time in red, but there were no nice uh, primary cilia um, coming from it. And so um, what we had, had concluded then was that the tau 3 gene encodes a central somal protein, which is necessary for primary cilia formation. So all this work then was done in the chick, and we were obviously keen to see whether it would translate more widely, whether this was a general um, phenomenon. And so what we did was based on uh, information um, that we gained from the chick, we identified the region of the uh, talpid 3 protein, which was necessary, the most crucial part that was necessary for cilia genesis. And we then uh, knocked this out uh, in a mouse and made a conditional talpid 3 mutant in the limb. And you can see here the mouse at the bottom here, how, how the mouse talpid 3 mutant has these wonderful um, uh, digits, uh, many of them, and all look very similar. And so uh, the work that was started in the chick um, translated into the mammalian limb. And eventually we were really delighted when clinical geneticists identified mutations in the tau 3 gene in human patients with a ciliopathy, which is called Joubert syndrome. And so it really was a case of uh, a mutant from, from barnyard to bedside. So thanks to the chick embryo then, um, I expect eventually all this would have been known, but it was uh, really uh, very satisfying um, to be able to see this project through um, from the initial work. It was like a detective story, uh, tracing um, this through to a, to a rather satisfying um, conclusion. So I started by thanking Hamburger and Hamilton. I used their tables every day in the lab when I sat down to stage a chick embryo in order to carry out an experiment. And I'd just like to end by thanking um, a lot of people in my lab, which um, worked with me uh, in a very enjoyable way on our friend to the chick embryo. And so I just want to end by sharing a, sli a slide of a picture taken fairly recently with some of the members of my lab, um, all of whom actually have worked um, on the chick embryo, and some of them um, are continuing to do so in their own labs. So that again is very satisfying. And I'd like to end there. Great, fantastic. So the chicken embryo built your career and it built the career of the people in your lab. Yeah, many of them. So yes. cool. Mm. So cool. Great. So thank you, really, the two of you very, very much for these amazing and I find inspiring talks. Um, we open the, the conversation now to people who want to speak and also the chat. Choose your way of speaking. Obviously, if everybody talks at the same time, Fung and I will try to organize this <laughs> a little bit. Um, but over to our audience. Good. So in a moment, I think people are still, I mean, there are still many thank you uh, messages for both of you yes. coming in on the chat. I hope you, hopefully you can see. Um, Anthony, you've got a question. It's just a comment for Cheryl. Cheryl, if I, if I remember, did Saunders, he was initially interested in the posterior necrotic zone. Yes, that's right. That's how he discovered the polarizing. So it was region. almost fortuitous. So he, yes. he grafted the posterior necrotic zone and then, oh my goodness, we've got extra digits. Yes, he'd also, though, done some experiments where he'd done um, limb rotations. In fact, I think those are some of the experiments that Drew talked about in the amphibians, where you got duplications. And of course, then he could understand those in terms of he was rotating the limb, he was taking the anterior. Um, a posterior and putting it adjacent to the anterior, but it was fortuitous. He was interested in the posterior necrotic zone and he was moving it around the limb bud to see whether it was autonomous or not. And that's when he discovered the, the polarizing region. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, that was Drew's point about, you know, do the experiment and then like, see how it plays out. <laughs> Well, it's, it's nice, nice to think that you're predicting, doing experiments in a predictive way, but it doesn't always work like that. <laughs> That's actually a question that I, that I had jotted down here. So how much, it's really a question to the two of you, um, how much were you able to plan systematically your work? How much would you say you played? So how much is down to systematically investigating something and how much is down to trying it out and sometimes you just have to see what comes of it? I want me to answer it first. Um, if I'm totally honest, and, and it's the old pasture quote about uh, 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 a chance favoring the prepared mind or something like that. Um, um, the embryo was always smarter than I was. Uh, and one day I was doing a bunch of transplants, quail to chick, moving them from midbrain to hindbrain, whatnot, thinking I'd get the same results as for migration. And, and I had done it in such a way, because for these surgeries, you do them every day, because for the first two weeks, they don't necessarily work well. And then you do them. And I was going to fix a whole lot of embryos at a uh, 12 day, 14, 16 day uh, age. Uh, and I started taking them. The first one I took out from the, the shell and I looked at it and I don't, it, right here, it had a little projection. And immediately I remembered Ambistema embryos had balancers. And I'm thinking, my God, the chicken has a balancer. <laughs> Um, the second one had the same and the third one, and that led to the three big chickens and, and the whole notion that I would study patterning, which had not in my mind. Uh, and, and that's very much a case where with no planning for an outcome, the outcome was a whole lot more interesting than any question I had asked in advance. Um, that happens to many. In Rita's case, when they they were trying to figure out what she and Stanley Cohen were trying to figure out, well, what kind of molecule is this growth factor? And they thought it might be a nucleic acid. So they said, well, how do we get rid of nucleic acids? Well, you take snake venom with phosphodiesterase. And the snake venom was more potent than the, the control. I said, <laughs> oh, that's not right. So they said, well, where does snake venom come from? It comes from salivary glands. And they said, oh, we got to get salivary glands. So Rita walked up to Florence Moe's lab and in her gentle way, I'm sure said, uh, Professor <laughs> Moe, I, I, I need some salivary glands. Well, anybody who has a mouse colony knows that you always have extra males. You know, just kind of waiting for whatever. And so Florence said, well, the only ones I have are these young males. You can have them. She took that. If she had given the Rita old males or females, they would have never found NGF in the salary. <laughs> Pure chance. Cheryl, you plan yes. a chance. Well, well I, I suppose the, uh, I suppose, I suppose one of the things when I went to work with Lewis was, uh, it was a very clear, we we're very clear predictions from his model. So we were very focused on answering those questions. Um, but I think, you know, discovering retinoic acid had that effect on the limb was was quite was quite lucky, really. It was just a chance thing. I mean, every so often I'd try something else. I, I tried actually putting in um, grafting um, various um, endocrine organ tissue from endocrine organs into the limb and things like that and um, all sorts of things. Um, so it was it was quite lucky. And um, uh well, of course, it was it was quite amazing because actually all the old ex other experiments showed that you couldn't, you know, just add anything to the limb and induce extra digits. So it was quite comforting, actually, that um, that was the case. Um, and actually, the role of retinoic acid in in limb limb, limb initiation is still um, controversial. I remember Peter Lawrence said to me, are you going to publish this or are you going to wait till you find out how what retinoic how retinoic acid does it? So I was glad I didn't take that advice because I still wouldn't have published it by now. 
I'd like to have another follow-up question to this. Um, you know, when we teach this and then the students are sitting there, the three axes of the limbs and they need to integrate all these very many sticking pathways. And this is when they start to hate me with a passion because it, in a textbook, it sounds as if you did this in an afternoon and we're done. Mm -hmm. So how many times had you, did you have to battle through failure, nothing was working and you felt you were flogging a dead horse? What with the limb? Yeah, I don't think I don't think I obviously I had to learn how to to manipulate the limb, and that took took a while. I mean, I didn't immediately just sort of run in and immediately be able to graft the polarizer region. But I was very lucky because Dennis Summerbell um, uh, helped me tremendously to with some of the sort of nuts and bolts of handling chick embryos. I'd handled them before, but I was only using them as tissue, which is a very different thing to actually uh, manipulating the limb bud. But yeah, once I got into right. it, I really enjoyed it. And so it was not really a hardship to, to sit there and, and experiment, experiment on the limb. I, I really enjoyed doing it. Um, my PhD was much more challenging. Um, I had to learn a lot of new techniques and I was the only person working on sorting out in Adam's lab um, so that was much more uh, traumatic than when I went to, to Lewis's lab, which was, was, was much easier. Drew, mm -hmm. you? Um, yeah, it was so long ago. Uh, <laughs> um, you really should ask some of my students because uh, I, I would always have to warn them that, you know, um, it's going to take a while. And, and, and you could never tell ahead of time uh, how long it would take for a student uh, to become proficient. I think that, and I always had fun with them, that the thing that I think was hardest about these, doing the experiments was that you knew you could not see the end of the tungsten needle in the embryo, but you had to be able to picture it in your mind. So I had my students study cross sections of stage eight embryos, stage nine embryos, because you had to see with your mind what you couldn't see with your eyes. Uh, um, and I, I, I used to get very frustrated that there would be papers published and their only criteria for a successful surgery was the embryo failed to die. Um, and, and that's not quite enough. Uh, you really had to have a much better feel because we have, we know nothing about wound healing in mesenchyme uh, 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 other than phenomenological, but um, uh, uh, no, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure I had bad weeks um, and, uh, and uh, avian, avian hatcheries, uh, 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 I, we had all of our eggs at Cornell. They have a big, had a big poultry science department, but I had to have no, when they turned over the flocks uh, because when they embryos, when their when their breeders were getting a little old, the vi older the viability went down, and then when they started young ones, the variation between ours in an incubator and the exact stage would be different. Mm -hmm. And and uh, but those are just technical. Still the case, not so yeah. strange. <laughs> when I, I when I went to work with um, Bruce Alberts. Um, um, one summer to to work on uh, on on the chick limb, and um, we had very great difficulty getting fertilized chick eggs. But there was a, a shop, a place in San Francisco, a grocery store that sold uh, fer fertile eggs allegedly because they were supposed to be better for you or something. And so I went into the shop and said, um, "I'd like to to buy a few dozen eggs. Are they really fertile?" And they say, "That's because I'm going to incubate them." And they were. <laughs> quite worried about, <laughs> about whether I have get any, any, any embryos. So I did get some, but not all of them. So I don't know uh, to what extent they were selling uh, guaranteed fertile eggs. Sharon, you made the point that the chicken embryo set the stage for concept development and mm. other model organisms followed maybe with more molecular detail but followed i would like to explore this a little bit because i'm wondering to which extent today we are running very busily trying to find 
very minute molecular details, which of course, if you want to understand networks is important, but do we lose the view of how conceptually something may work? Hmm. Well, I think that's very true. Um, I, I'm not sure. I would have thought from what we heard from Drew and so on that the amphibian embryo was really, I think, one of the trailblazers blazes in, in concepts. Um, but the chick embryo is a very is very convenient, a very convenient model because you can get the eggs quite care, quite easily, mm -hmm. and they're easy, relatively easy to to manipulate. But I agree. I mean, you could say, well, when is the problem solved? Um, so you could say, well, say for the the chick limb discovery of the polarizing region might be solving how the anteroposterior axis works. Um, when I went for an interview before I went to the States, um, I got a fellowship to go and work with Trinkus. The person there, this was, at the, this was in um, 1969, asked me what I wanted to do long term. And I said, I wanted to work on limb development, actually. And he said, oh, no, you shouldn't work on that because all, everything's already known. So it depends what you mean by known. Then you could say, well, when Sonic Hedgehog was discovered, then maybe that's the end of the story. You know, it depends, depends what end point you choose. But I agree. I mean, as you go on in more detail, you need somehow to be able to keep in your mind the sort of general all over picture of what, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to find out. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, with all this, I don't know whether this is true, but I think with all this information about all the different molecules and that, eventually... Um, it reminds me a bit of when Hox genes began to be discovered. It was like confusing. There were all these different things. Nobody knew what was what. But eventually, maybe with all the, the molecules, you'll find like um, sort of cassettes or um, uh, things which are repeated over and over again. And so it'll become clearer again. Well, you'll, you'll get a lot of detail. And then suddenly you'll be able to see a, a, a bigger picture and, and it'll become easier again. I don't know whether that's true or not. Mm -hmm. I would actually invite the community to comment on this because this this is a very interesting line of thought. Will it be system overload forever for us and we die under the load? I mean, I'm pushing this now under the overload of information or will we be able to achieve clarity and how? I think in a way that that also links to a question that I would have had for for both Drew and 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 Cheryl that that is more the advice for for young scientists setting out on their career and to some extent it's it's a similar kind of question um, how do you work on the detail without losing um, sight of the overall aim of the of, of of what we are trying to achieve and I think that can be can be quite difficult. So I wonder if you had any experience like that also in your career and, and maybe with the people who, who, you, um, who came through your labs over time and have built their own careers. That's a, uh, that's a, very, uh, uh, that's a very conceptual question. Uh, <laughs> um, if you go to a blackboard, a whiteboard, or whatever, and you write down a concept, it does not lead you to a good experiment. An experiment has to be narrowly focused, and I don't care whether it's doing CRISPR or a transplant. You have to have it. It has to be focused, and you have to be able to say there's a reasonable set of alternative outcomes at whatever level you're studying. So in that respect, you say, well, maybe it's not. The difference is, and I'll give you an example. When I was at my PhD oral exams, one of the people there who thought a lot of himself um, as a whatever, and he said, okay, you're getting a doctorate in philosophy. Is there anything philosophical in your work? And I, I forget what I mumbled an answer, but I, I've thought about that ever since. Um, I think our minds work on conceptual basis. You have a philosophy, you have a set of beliefs, and in science, you have a set of concepts. And to me, that, that kind of is the joy of 
being a scientist, it does not what I do when I walk into the lab. Um, and, and I can't imagine having fun in the lab if I didn't have that broader sense. And maybe it's old fashioned. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I regret that very few PhD programs in developmental biology spend more than passing time on the history and philosophy of science. I took three graduate courses in it. The third one taught by Victor. And, and that imprinted in me, you know, in ways I would never have otherwise gotten a sense of what's been done in the past, why it was done. And, and that's for me as part of the fun. Um, I had to do a lot of lab work. I had to, in, went to Charlie Emerson's lab to learn how to do in C2s because I could do modern technology in the nineties. Uh, I got another five-year NIH grant. Uh, I then immediately taught the technicians how to do all that stuff. I had no pleasure with that. I looked at the embryos, I did, did surgeries, and then everything else got done and the students and I worked together with the microscopes. And, and that was so much fun. Mm -hmm. But I guess from what you're saying is you, your joy in doing science to some extent comes from being creative, having your mind endorse a problem and then start to think about puzzle solving before actually running and doing an experiment. Is that a fair representation, you think? I, I think it's more subconscious than you're giving me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about where the chicken got you to, and I can see some questions actually in the chat feed coming up, looking into where would we go next? I would actually like to hear from the two of you where you think the chicken model could be going to. Would you take the chicken up now? If you were to take it up now, where do you think should the chicken model develop into or towards to make it still be the, the kind of rich source resource that you experienced during your career? Well, if I can go first, the first thing I would say is that every one of the model organism vertebrates that we use are extreme examples. Mm -hmm. If you said, what's a typical bird, you would not pick a domestic chicken. Uh, I'm not sure which one you would. So, so the first thing we have to recognize is that model systems are a practical necessity but they are not any more than Heckel's drawings. They are not <laughs> necessarily representative of a broader way of doing it. That's why, that's why you, all these papers compare mouse and zebrafish and, and whatnot up and down the line. Mm. Um, uh, I would just share a, sort of a parallel thing. Victor wrote an article in the uh, 80s. He published it and he essentially said, the era of experimental embryology is gone past. And he and I corresponded often. And I said, no, it isn't. I'm still here. I'm making a living. And, and we, we went back and forth on this. And, and he, he was defining it narrowly in the Spamanesque emerging cut and paste phenomenological view. And I said, well, um, you know, there are new assay methods. I mean, just think of, you know, quail marker <laughs> I mean, that salvaged a decade and a half of Nicole's whole career and a decade and a half of mine, uh, Nicole Adoran. Uh, and and uh, then you think of being able to do in C2s and then you combine that with a, a transplant of, uh, Victor did transplants with creeper chickens. You do talk about uh, uh, what Cheryl talked about with chicken. And so there are new assay methods available. Um, uh, at some point, cutting and pasting of whole tissues does not lead you to what individual cells are doing. Uh, it tells you what populations uh, are capable of. Uh, and that's a limitation that you're not going to get around. Uh, uh, mouse transgenics can get you a little bit closer in that they can be lineage specific. Uh, but uh, unbelievable assays, so. And I would just end it when I 
when I gave a, a similar talk to this at Cornell two years ago, um, and, and I, I gave them Gary Schoenworth's definition of experimental embryology, which says it's all about cutting and pasting. And I ended my talk. Yeah. And, and I ended my talk asking, well, what's the difference between that and CRISPR? And, uh, and they still applauded. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, your take. Well, I think uh, that sounds uh, sounds very interesting. Uh, I suppose the thing is you can't get away from the fact that um, you know straightforward genetics is not really possible in the chicken, or not very easy in the chicken. Um, but I, I agree. I think Megan said the best is something about many interesting problems still left that that chickens could be um, uh, uh, deal with. I think growth, for example, is one very interesting area about which we don't really know very much at all, actually. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is that um, if you can do it, you can hop between different models. And that's often quite, quite informative mm -hmm. to hop between, you know, the chicken and the fish. But, but obviously you need the facilities, um, you know, in order to do this effectively and, and to mouse as well, if you wish. Mm -hmm. And I think the example I showed with FGFs and the mouse, I mean, it'd be a lot easier to do it these days than it was when Gail did it. But it, that was a huge amount of work uh, involved in that. And I know at the moment there's a great emphasis on human development. So that's something else to think about. Right. Um, I, I think we have gone a long way, really a long way from how the chicken became a model through the influential work that to some extent really um, all relied on Hamburg and Hamilton's normal stages, even though of course there are other staging systems um, that are also available. We heard two amazing speakers who I never fail to enjoy listening to, yeah, Drew and Cheryl, and I can only Thank you with the depths of my heart. It was so great that you agreed to do this and come around today. Thanks for participating and, and making this, this symposium work. And Thank I you, just hope we stay in touch. We, now that we are in touch again, now that hopefully we come out of COVID, let's stay in touch and, and this will be fun and will be good for the model. <laughs>